Greetings all. It is Tuesday, July uh, 14th. I'm in Napa Valley. It's, uh, it's going to get up to about uh, probably 38 degrees today. Like I'm sitting here with uh, Joe Cafaro uh, from Napa Valley. Uh, most of you probably have not heard of Joe Cafaro, but he's been making wines in Napa Valley since 1969. 69. 69. Yes. Who are some of the guys you work for? Uh, well, my very first job was with uh, a fairly small winery called Charles Krug. <laughs> that was that's actually the largest winery I've ever worked for. Then after that, uh, a string of wineries, Chapelet in the 70s, uh, a new winery, well then was called Keenan, which I helped start. And then uh, another string of wineries, uh, Oakville Ranch, uh, Della Valle, uh, Sinsky. Uh, How'd you go? Good morning. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You're on camera. <laughs> the owner of Minor Winery. Um, He's entitled to do that. Um, started my own label in uh, '86, so uh, so this would be the 23rd year for Cafaro Cellars. So. Okay. Cool. Now I discovered uh, Cafaro Cellars in about '88 or '89. I bought a bottle of '86 at a wine uh, at a wine shop in San Francisco, and. Uh, just tasted it about four or five years ago for uh, Christmas at our family's house, and it was absolutely delicious. Joe's been known um, over the years. He's uh, sourced his wines, or sorry, his grapes, a variety of different vineyards. And about uh, 12 or 14 years ago, he bought his own vineyard just above Clodeval and Chimney Rock. That's uh, about a 600 foot elevation. This is the first time in a few years that I've tasted with Joe, um, and this is the first time I've tasted wines from his uh, vineyard and I have to tell you these are spectacular these are the antithesis of Napa Valley wines they're lower in alcohol they're food friendly they've got great great subtle flavors long rich but without being fatiguing on the palate so let's try let's try the Merlot again because sorry I've got a tear alta here so this is a bottle of the 2000, and I'll look at it again, 2005 Merlot. And it's a wine that's, let's just go and smell it. Oh, it's got that beautiful little herbal note, leafy note. Yeah. And what happens with a lot of wines in Napa Valley, they pick so late that these subtle nuances get burnt off. And that's what gives a wine flavor and intrigue and depth. And uh, Joe has figured it out, but some other guys haven't. Uh, what do you, what do you th tell, tell me? Tell me your thoughts on this one. Well, I've always it really comes down to the way I uh, like to drink wines from a personal perspective. I'm making the wines that I like to drink, and I love to drink wines with uh, food, and I love the interplay and the uh, the way food and wine can play off of each other and ex and uh, help each other actually during the meal. So what I'm trying to create is wines that have balance, elegance, that uh, complement the meal. And with that, I find that the wines have many, many layers of flavors. Because uh, we talked about earlier um, about the Merlot being a blend. It has a little bit of Cabernet, a little bit of Petit Verdot, a little Cabernet Franc, which I grow. But that gives it the wines multiple layers, many things going on. And I want my Merlot to be bright and uh, forward, uh, but again, have the acidity to hold up to food. Uh, yeah, this is this is delicious wine. If I put this in a wine tasting against uh, some Bordeaux, you would think it would be Bordeaux. There's no question in my mind. I will say that I, I have been accused of being Bordeaux-like. Uh, That's I'm, good. <laughs> I'm not, not really trying to create a Bordeaux wine. That's something that only can be done in Bordeaux. Uh, what I'm trying to create is the best wines that I like from Napa Valley. And I think that Napa has some of the best Cabernet Merlot growing area in the world. Uh, it's different than Bordeaux, but it has some nuances that really can show. And you can get these layers. Um, if you grow it right, pick it right. Make, make it, it right. right. <laughs> Find the right piece. This, I, I have to tell you folks, this is... Uh, for me, this wine is, uh, I, I've got, look, I've got goosebumps on my, on my, on my forearms and the back of my neck because I just, when I find wines like this, I just, 
I just get turned on because this is what Napa Valley can do. And too many people are making these, you know, 15, 14 and a half percent alcohol wines, which are fatiguing to drink. You might as well have a glass of whiskey in the middle of the Sahara, for all, for all I'm concerned. Um, we're moving on to the uh, 2005 Cabernet, and this is this has got a little bit of Malbec, Petit Verdot. No, no Malbec. Malbec. I'm sorry. Cabernet Franc, Franc. Petit Verdot, and Merlot. Uh, but both the Merlot and Cabernet, roughly mm. about 90 percent the main variety. Uh, I do want those varieties to stand out uh, and to be really the predominant aromas and flavors. The other three varieties are there just to add accents, uh, layers, and spice, uh, as it were. So the Cabernet for me is has the berryness of Cabernet, but there's a little spiciness that comes from Petit Verdot, and a little bit of the herbal qualities that come from both Cabernet Franc and Merlot. This is this is truly delicious. You know, in a blind tasting, you know, this tastes like Cote de Marquis, which is okay. Little Velos, yeah, nice Saint Julien, yeah. beautiful wine. Uh, I love it. Okay, we're going to move on to last. Yeah. And this is a, I'll get Joe to explain it. This is a new, new tasting for me. This one uh, he's pouring right now is our O2 Alta Tierra. Uh, Alta Tierra simply is a proprietary name that I came up with, simply meaning in Spanish roughly uh, high ground or high soil. My vineyard is a hillside vineyard at about 600 feet, so it's a high ground. I want to emphasize the, the best from the vineyard. Uh, this is Cabernet and Petit Verdot, about 8% Petit Verdot, so it's still a very high percentage Cabernet. Um, it's treated a little bit differently when it's fermented. It's what we call extended maceration. It's 100% extended maceration. The other big thing is the bottle age on this wine. This is an O2. This got four years of bottle age, uh, and I released it just a few months ago. So it is an older vintage, um, but it's what? you can see with my wines with some bottle age. And they really do open up and improve. Uh, this, this is, this is, these are truly uh, revolutionary wines <laughs> for me. And now, I mean, I've been following Joe for, I guess probably since about 1988, 89, bringing in his wines uh, on and off over the years. And uh, they're gonna be reintroduced again in the store because these are truly delicious wines and they're not available in, huge quantities. In fact, he's making less wine from 3,500 cases just a few years ago to this vintage 2009, probably less than a thousand. So this is truly one of the, if you want to call it that, undiscovered cult wines, but uh, I kind of don't like that because uh, these are these are not typical cult wines. This is a great underground winery uh, made by one of the most uh, thoughtful winemakers in Napa Valley, great guy. And I encourage you, if you're ever in Napa Valley, to uh, Give him a call, he'll always have the time if he's not traveling or away with his family and taste his wines. Cheers, thanks for listening. Cheers. Thank you.